This is Jose Merino, Editor-in-Chief of the Neurology Family of Journals. The Neurology Podcast provides practical information to neurologists and other clinicians to help them provide better care for their patients. Thanks for listening and have a great week. Hi, this is Jeff Ratliff with the Neurology Podcast. Today I'm with Jason Margaleski, a movement disorder specialist at the University of Miami and the author of an article in Neurology Clinical Practice titled Blepharoclonus and Parkinsonism. In this paper, Jason and his colleagues evaluated the finding of blepharoclonus in patients with Parkinson's disease and atypical Parkinsonian disorders to explore whether this clinical phenomenology may be useful in our evaluation and diagnosis of patients with Parkinsonism. Jason, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Jeff. Thank you very much for having me. We're excited to learn from you. And normally I kick off the interview trying to just get a high level summary of the findings. But I think this time before we get into the data and the results, I want to talk a little bit about the phenomenology itself. What is blepharoclonus? How do they examine for it? What are the findings that they're looking for? So as a fellow movement disorder doctor, I totally appreciate kind of starting this conversation uh, with the customary phenomenology chat. First thing I'll say is that blepharoclonus should be distinguished from blepharospasm. So for some reason, this comes up a lot when uh, whenever I talk about or say the word blepharoclonus, I feel like it's not necessarily a very familial term. And then people think about blepharospasm, which is totally different. So that's like that tonic bilateral contraction of the orbicularis oculi, like a focal dystonia. Blepharoclonus is different. So blepharoclonus is when you ask a patient to gently close their eyes the eyelids will kind of flutter. It's a sustained flutter. It'll resolve if they squeeze too tightly. It'll resolve if they open their eyes up again. I mean, it looks more like a tremor or maybe the name's even, you know, apt with clonus in it. It's really like a clonus. It's like a oscillating stretch reflex, the lid fluttering up and down, usually pretty regular rate. And that's blepharoclonus. I think looking at the video in the article actually would be a very helpful way to (laughs) help recognize the phenomenology and very easy to evaluate. Ask them to close their eyes and just observe. And I agree with you. The videos in the article online are fantastic. And so the eyelid flutters up and down. But just to be clear, the eye does not open and close. The eyelid is sort of moving up and down, but the palpebral fissure remains intact and closed. That's exactly correct. Now, you've mentioned that people have talked about blepharoclonus in textbooks and in the literature for a number of years. And so What was the inspiration for this study? So despite that awareness over decades of this as a possible component in the Parkinsonian examination, what did we know about it already? And maybe more importantly, what did we not know? What was the gap in knowledge that you and your colleagues were hoping to address here? When I first became aware of it, I actually thought it was a pretty novel observation that I was making. And only in, and now in retrospect, after review of the literature, I know that it's been around. But it was while I was in fellowship trying to do a good general neurological exam on all of my Parkinson's patients when we were testing for Romberg, I asked them to close their eyes and I noted the eyelid fluttering. And it's something that I noted over and over again in these patients. And one day I wanted to investigate a little bit further. And finally, in the last year or so, I had that time. I don't think we knew very much about it in terms of idiopathic Parkinson's disease and and any associations. From my review, it mainly came up in the realm of case reports and a lot of different conditions, head injuries, uh, hydrocephalus, people with VP shunts. I only came upon it in Parkinson's disease after somebody sent me a PDF of uh, Marsden's movement disorder textbook chapter and said, hey, look, he mentions it here. And I guess I just wanted to say that, that there's a very wise movement disorder luminary who I heard talking at a conference who said that when you think you've found something novel in movement disorders, that you should probably read this textbook and see if, uh, if Professor Marsden already talked about it or wrote about it. And that proved to be true. But but even in that book, it just said that patients with Parkinson's can have blepharoclonus. That's it. It didn't really talk about the phenomenology in much detail, nothing about its potential prevalence. I mean, nowhere has there been like a standard assessment of how to how to really evaluate for this condition. Got it. So I think that's a good pearl too. If you think you found something new, see if David Marston already described it before you even were born, probably. That's right. So we've talked about blepharoclonus. You know, it's out there, but we don't really know. And it sounds like it's not specific to Parkinson's. You mentioned hydrocephalus and patients who have had VP shunts placed. So it's not specific to Parkinsonian disorders, but it is an exam finding that is out there. And so in this study, you and your team were looking at and for the presence or absence of blepharoclonus in a number of patients with both Parkinson's disease and atypical Parkinsonian disorders. And so can you describe what you and your team found with regards to blepharoclonus in these Parkinsonian patients? 
conclusion basically is that blepharoclonus was very prevalent in patients with idiopathic Parkinson's disease, much less prevalent in patients with other Parkinsonian syndromes. So we found it in 84% of 75 patients with idiopathic Parkinson's and 30% of the other cohort that was admittedly much smaller and made up of various conditions that, that weren't idiopathic Parkinson's disease. And that was also kind of in line with some previous smaller studies that we had published in abstracts of the AN over the years, 30 patients, 20 patients, but very similar prevalence uh, repeated in this, in this larger study now. So common in patients with Parkinson's disease, less common in the other um, atypical disorders. And in looking at the paper, w- even within that cohort of 70-something patients with Parkinson's disease, you were looking within that cohort about associations of blepharoclonus with other phenomenon. And so those of us who see patients with Parkinson's disease certainly recognize that there's a lot of variability in both the signs and symptoms across our Parkinson's disease patients. And we know that things like tremor are not universally present or that non-motor phenomenology like psychosis or REM behavior disorder are in some patients but not others. And so when we look at blepharoclonus, you guys were looking at whether its presence or absence was associated with the presence or absence of some of these other Parkinson's-related phenomena and symptoms. And so can you describe what you found within that PD-only cohort? Yeah, so so blepharoclonus was basically almost ubiquitous across the whole cohort, regardless of any associated motor or non-motor symptoms. We found out of the symptoms that we looked for, the non-motor depression, anxiety, constipation, sleep problems, REM sleep behavior disorder. They existed in, in kind of the prevalence that you would expect in a population of Parkinson's disease patients, but there's no association whether they had or didn't have those non-motor features with whether they had or did not have blepharoclonus present. We didn't look at every motor sign, but we did look for the presence or absence of dyskinesia and basically tremor severity because it's sort of like an eyelid tremor, so we figured that made sense to compare it to, but again, no no association. Maybe a trend towards association with dyskinesia, but it, it didn't meet the significance. Got it. So it doesn't cluster with other sort of Parkinsonian features. Not at all. And got it. Okay. So now as we look between your two cohorts, your Parkinson's disease cohort and your non-Parkinson's disease atypical cohort, you did have some findings. And you mentioned it already that the cohort of patients with atypical disorders was relatively small and heterogeneous in that there were patients with PSP or MSA or dementia with Lewy bodies all in that same cohort. And typically each individual disease was only represented by maybe four patients at most, but tended to be fewer. And so we know that this is relatively early single center study and the caveats that come with that. But that said, can you tell us more about what you found with regards to blepharoclonus, its presence or absence in some of the specific atypical Parkinsonian disorders as opposed to the ubiquity you found in your patients with Parkinson's disease? So small numbers can't necessarily make firm conclusions based on the results, but I do think it's informative if we maybe separate them into the synucleinopathies and the other Parkinsonian syndromes that were evaluated. So in doing that, we had five and five, and some of the other synucleinopathy patients, three out of the five, did have blepharoclonus present, including uh, dementia of Lewy body patients and one with with multiple system atrophy. But but none of the patients who did not have a synucleinopathy, so patients with progressive supranuclear palsy and a few with drug-induced Parkinson's disease, none, none in that cohort showed blepharoclonus on exam. A future study should be looking at a larger cohort of these atypical patients, I think particularly the talopathies and the drug-induced patients, to see if this could be a useful diagnostic clinical biomarker of sorts to differentiate Parkinson's disease from atypical syndromes or maybe synucleinopathies from non-synuclein pathologies. From my just personal observations, I think it might be particularly helpful in these drug-induced patients. I like to take a look when I'm being asked to evaluate for a drug-induced for idiopathic PD. Yeah, I think that pearl is helpful, and and you're right, it needs more study, but that could certainly be useful, and I know that can be a diagnostic conundrum sometimes when we have patients who are on those dopamine antagonizing medications and trying to figure out, are we looking at emerging Parkinson's disease or purely drug-induced phenomenon? So Jason, now having done this study, I'd love to hear from you about how your thought process or your practice has changed. And so when you're evaluating Parkinsonian patients, are you now 
in the habit of always looking for blepharoclonus? And when you see it, is it having an impact on your clinical reasoning or the conversations you're having with patients? Or am I getting too far ahead and we need to sort of learn more about it? Well, we definitely have to not get far ahead of ourselves, but I do think that it's worth looking for. So I've incorporated it into my exam of patients with the Parkinsonian syndrome. I find it very easy to sift it into when I'm evaluating for rest tremor. I ask them to close their eyes anyway, I often count backwards, do serial sevens or something distracting. And I just use that opportunity to get a little bit closer in and take a look at their eyelids while, while they're counting. I often double check it when I'm doing Romberg, if I'm checking for Romberg also. So I find it again easy just to sift it into the current exam, doesn't add very much time. And I think like you mentioned before, it's, it's potentially sensitive, but not a specific finding. And I do note it in a lot of patients who just don't have any Parkinsonian condition at all. I mean, I don't think much of it when I see it in that context. Uh, it definitely hasn't been studied, and it's not what I think it's useful for based on, on these results. And by no means should we be using this presence or absence of blepharoconus to make a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. In our study, you know, one in six patients with Parkinson's did not have blepharoconus. I just think it should be thought about in the larger constellation of motor and non-motor symptoms that we look for when we're trying to build a case towards the diagnosis of Parkinson's versus one of its you know, cousins of other Parkinsonian syndromes. And when you're having that discussion with patients trying to make a clinical diagnosis and you're discussing why you suspect it based on your history and exam findings, perhaps you can list and say, oh, you know, you also happen to have this thing called blepher cloners, your eyelids flutter when you close them, and, and that with long history of REM sleep behavior disorder and constipation, now rest tremor and bradykinesia. It's consistent with the diagnosis, potentially. So I think it could be part of the discussion, but but definitely, again, with that larger constellation. And also just to note that, that patients are never really bothered by it. Uh, I don't think any had noticed that they had it before I pointed it out. So it's definitely not a symptom to chase and treat. I don't even know if it's levodopa responsive, but, but it definitely doesn't seem to be bothersome. And if you're suspecting a patient has Parkinson's disease based on everything, but you don't see blepharoclonus, again, it could still just be Parkinson's disease, but maybe use it as a reminder to look for signs of atypical features to suggest a different Parkinsonian symptom. Syndrome and maybe a reminder to ask that medication history about exposure to dopamine blocking agents. That's where it stands for me clinically currently. Definitely a lot of future directions, though, to, to investigate further. The study is a really interesting jumping off point to better categorize the phenomenon itself and see where it starts to fall across that Parkinsonian spectrum, but not something necessarily that we're going to be hanging our hats on from a diagnostic perspective, but something to incorporate, something to keep an eye out for, and certainly an area to study further. So I've been speaking with Jason Margaleski from the University of Miami about his paper published in Neurology Clinical Practice titled Blepharoclonus and Parkinsonism. And you can find his paper online now and in print in the February 6, 2024 issue of Neurology Clinical Practice. Jason, thanks for joining us today. Well, thank you again so much for inviting me. And uh, Jeff, I hope the next few Parkinson's patients you see in clinic that you take a look for this. Please let me know what you find. Definitely will. Thanks, Jason. This is Stacey Clardy, your podcast editor. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please take a few moments to subscribe, rate, and review the Neurology Podcast through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And remember, you can always head to neurology.org backslash podcast for our full list of past episodes, or you can also search by keyword in your podcast app for any neurology-specific topics you want to learn about.